Hello everyone, my name is Gabriel Said Reynolds. I teach here at the University of Notre Dame. This is the first of a series of videos on this YouTube channel where we will be speaking about the Quran and the Bible. Uh, it starts with me, for better or for worse, and I'm here with my friend uh, Hassan. So good to be with you. Thank you for having me, Professor. And yeah, he'll be asking me some questions so I'll have a chance to um, present some of my ideas about the Quran and the Bible. Um, hopefully you'll find some of them interesting. Um, if you do, or maybe just what the heck, why not just um, in the hope that you will, uh, right now go ahead and uh, subscribe and hit the like and uh, the bell to be notified for future videos so that you can stay in touch with this YouTube channel. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Um, and I'm very happy and excited to be here. And we've got a lot of really cool material to discuss, and I'm sure it will be a, a, a good time. A lot about the Quran and the Bible, a lot of your principal research is on these matters and uh, I think it'll be a great video for uh, for everyone watching so without further ado let's uh, let's get into it All right. absolutely so so professor I want to start with something kind of personal just get everyone introduced to sure. who you are and what you do and um, so maybe if you just want to start with just I, I assume a lot of the people here will have some idea of who you are and what you do but maybe just say a little bit about yourself and then maybe why you decided to study the Quran and the Bible, and we'll go from there. Great. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's a long version of that story, <laughs> but I'll spare you. Uh, and there's a very short, short version, which is that I'm fascinated by the Quran and the Bible. So let me try to give the middle version that gives a little bit of my background and my entry into Quranic studies. Um, it, it starts with my family, basically, and so I have you know, some family background on my mother's side, which is um, uh, from the Middle East. My grandfather was Syrian. And so um, he did not pass down the Arabic language to the family. And so I grew up sort of with this curiosity generally about learning, learning Arabic. And that led me as an undergraduate at Columbia University in New York City to start studying Arabic. So that was like the first step, right? And then the second step was during my undergraduate days, I began traveling in order to learn Arabic to the Middle East, uh, first to Jordan and then to Syria. And gosh, I remember just this encounter with lived Islam in the Middle East, even hearing the call to prayer broadcast through the loudspeakers in the airport, um, in, in the Amman airport, I think, and realizing, wow, this is, this is a, a faith that's public, um, that you know, many people, not, not all people are super religious and we should avoid the sort of generalizations, but many people are in the Islamic world. And, um, and then I had lots of conversations with people who you know, were curious about what is this Westerner doing in the Middle East and from taxi cabs to the cafeteria at the university where I was studying to friends I would meet playing, uh, playing soccer and things. All sorts of conversations which led me to want to understand um, Islam better, but especially from an academic perspective. I'm not really interested in um, debates about, like, you know, the truth of the revelation or uh, religious debates and things like that, but I've always been interested in, okay, if we're sort of, like, nerdy about this, uh, what can we really know about Islam, especially its relationship to the pre-existing context, including Christianity and Judaism and, and late antiquity generally. And that led me on to a PhD eventually. So after finishing at Columbia, I went to Yale for a PhD. And uh, in the religious studies department, I studied with a great German scholar by the name of Gerhard Bervering and had wonderful colleagues, fellow students there at Yale and uh, ended up here at Notre Dame. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sure. that, Professor. And even though I'm interviewing you today, I'm just helping you with this. and. Um, I wanted to ask, this is your YouTube channel, so why are you now um, you know, starting a YouTube channel? Um, why are we having this conversation now, and what will come in the future? Right, so uh, there are a lot of YouTube channels out there, so it's, I guess it's kind of uh, unfortunate to add one <laughs> more, maybe. But because there are many YouTube channels out there, there's a lot of um, uh, confusion, I think, especially about the topic of religion. And so there are a lot of people who are arguing from certain perspectives, uh, who are involved in debates or polemics between religions. And then you hear like everything. You know, my students at Notre Dame, I get really wary with uh, the way that they research for their papers and things by going to different websites. 
And I tell them, you know, like, you just don't know what you're going to find on YouTube or on other, uh, on other websites or social, social media outlets. And so, um, I mean, the goal of, the, of this YouTube channel is to provide sort of nerdy information, sort of academic information about the Quran and the Bible. And there'll be many, um, there'll be many guests who will come who are specialists, you know, sort of, you know, um, much, much smarter than me, oh. who are regarded, you know, uh, around the world as leaders in the field. And to provide sort of that, um, that academic perspective on questions around the Quran and the Bible, I think it'll be interesting to people who are fervent believers, whether they're Muslims, Jews, or Christians, or otherwise, but also be interested to anyone who just is curious intellectually about the origins of the Bible, the origins of the Quran, and the relationship between the two. Absolutely. Well, yeah, you're much too humble, Professor. Um, but thank you for that. Um, that's, very, um, that's very interesting. And it's really, yeah, I think, a great, um, a great gift to all of us that you're on YouTube. So I guess to begin kind of the meat of this and start actually discussing um, the Quran, the Bible, let's start where, with, let's start with something that I think people coming to this channel, um, what maybe would spark their interest about this. And right. Which is, what does the Quran say about the Bible? Okay, that's a big question. That's a very big question. So, <laughs> let's say, yeah. what does the Quran say about maybe, we can break this down, the biblical text, um, the biblical characters, maybe themes, um, and then maybe we can work on to Jews and Christians in Terrific. particular. Yeah, great. Well, um, I mean, it's a big question in part because um, the Quran says a lot and a little try to make that clear. <laughs> it sounds like a, a paradoxical answer. Um, but the Quran says a lot because it engages with a lot of biblical characters and biblical accounts. But it says a little because it doesn't give precise references to biblical books as a rule. So, I mean, just for example, right, the main categories that Jews and Christians use to refer to the Bible um, don't appear in the Quran. So, um, now, the Arabic word kitab, when the Quran speaks about the kitab, that probably refers to sort of um, the divine storehouse of revelation, of God's wisdom, generally. And we could speak more about that. That's a difficult word, kitab. Sure. That will probably come up in some interviews, too. Um, but it doesn't refer to the Old Testament or the New Testament. Uh, it doesn't refer to the Hebrew Bible or the Tanakh, as Jews would refer to the Bible. Be, meaning the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. Um, so it does refer, it does have this Arabic word Torah or Taurat, uh, which seems to be used for the revelation given to Moses. And then it has this word for gospel in Arabic, Injil, coming from the Greek word Evangelion, most likely, although there's some debates over how it got from, uh, from Greek into Arabic. That's an interesting question. But it doesn't cite things precisely. For example, it doesn't refer to Jesus healing, say, the leper, and say, this appears in this or that gospel. So there's a lot of questions one can ask about the relationship between what the Quran actually says about the Bible, what we actually find in the Bible. Um, it may be the one exceptional example of a reference to the Bible is where the Quran speaks about this book known as the Zabur, which is often translated as Psalms. And there's one verse in the Quran which um, refers to um, uh, the righteous servants of God inheriting the earth, uh, which seems to be related to one Psalm in, in particular. And the fact that it says, that we have written in the Zubur. And then you have a quotation which seems to be from the Psalms, yeah. seems to confirm to most people, well, here's one example where the Quran is actually referring to and quoting from a biblical biblical book. The answer could go on and on, and I don't want to just uh, do, do that and be boring. But um, I, I would say there are really interesting questions we could speak about more about was the Bible actually translated into Arabic at the time of the Quran's origins? And um, if it wasn't, and I think it wasn't, um, certainly that's the opinion of Sidney Griffith, who's written a really interesting book on the Bible in Arabic. Um, then how was the Quran 
or the Quran's author engaging with the biblical subtext, with the biblical world? How did it? How did the Quran's author know about the Bible? Um, That's a, a really insightful answer, Professor. It's a very big question, of course. Um, what does the Quran say about the Bible? I imagine it says um, a lot about different aspects of the Bible, and there's it's very rich and, and deep there. So I guess maybe if you wouldn't mind, we can break this down a little bit and start with something like biblical characters, right? So you you mentioned this kind of um, biblical subtext and this biblical um, kind of environment, maybe, or, you know, at least that there are, there are biblical things that come up in the Quran. Right, so right. Uh, I, I imagine one of them might be characters. So maybe tell us a little bit more about that. So how does the Quran kind of, how does the Quran use or interpret biblical characters? So the cast of, of biblical characters in the Quran is really interesting. Um, many of the most important characters to the biblical story appear also in the Quran. But there are certain um, omissions which are interesting as well, right? Like it's interesting to find things that are there and things that are not there as yeah. well. Both are interesting. So um, the Quran is, is especially interested in the characters of Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. And that makes sense not only based on the biblical text, but on the prominence in w with which um, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus were regarded by both Jews and Christians in late antiquity. So, um, you know, for, for Christians, the biblical story is a story of, of covenants. And um, that probably begins with Noah, maybe with Adam for most Christians. Um, but the covenants of Abraham and Moses and then Christ and the church are the central um, sort of moments, um, signposts in the biblical story. Um, for Jews as well, of course, um, uh, the promise of Abraham is the beginning of the formation of an identity as, as a people, and um, the center of Judaism is the covenant um, or the reception of the law, maybe from a more Jewish perspective, on Mount Sinai. So it's, it's no surprise to see those um, three characters as being really, really central. Um, but then there's some omissions as well. So there's a lot of the characters that from the book of Genesis appear in the Quran, beginning with Adam, including Noah, but then Abraham and also Lot. Lot's a really interesting case, right? Because he's not a moral exemplar at all in the biblical story, and the Bible authors clearly do not want him to be. It's not that they tried to make him a, a moral exemplar in a virtuous upright character and failed. It's He's actually a negative example. He's an example of someone who um, uh, shows how shows us how one, at least in part, should not act in the episode of Genesis 19. Um, uh, and um, so other characters in Genesis are also important, including Isaac and Jacob. Um, and then Moses is really prominent, the most named character in uh, the Quran. But a lot of the prophetic characters, the major prophets of the Bible, so Isaiah, Isaiah Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel, the major prophets as they're known in Christian tradition, um, are not there in, in the Qur'an. Um, in fact, from the prophetic books, um, per se, the ones known as prophetic books, it's just Jonah, which is a tiny book. That's an interesting example, too. It's a four-chapter book in the Bible, so almost insignificant, but it's the sort of story that would have been related orally and passed down. I mean, even now, people like to tell the story of Jonah and the, the great fish, right, that swallows him. And so it's no surprise that if the biblical stories are going to be passed down, maybe not through a written text, but by oral transmission, that this one would have made it to the Hejaz, to, to the region of Arabia where Islam began. So uh, that's a little bit more. I guess we could speak about individual characters. If there's one in particular, I could uh, elaborate more. Yeah, well, let's see. Abraham often gets discussed as um, kind of a unifying maybe character right uh across right. Yeah, abrahamic know, religion absolutely yeah yes. so maybe how how is how is abraham in the quran um maybe similar or different from abraham in the bible uh, or the stories of abraham that appear in the quran well it's a great question because the category abrahamic religions is debated right precisely because there's this question over whether Abraham is a figure that unites Jews, Christians, and Muslims, or divides them. 
and um, the logic behind the phrase Abrahamic religions is, oh, of course he's someone who unites us. Um, we all have a common faith in Abraham, and sometimes in a really sort of simplistic way, there's this idea that, oh, well, the Jews and therefore the Christians descended from Isaac, one son of Abraham, and the Arabs, therefore the Muslims, descended from Ishmael, or Ismail in Arabic, another son of Abraham, and we have a common father, therefore let's all get together and love one another, right? So that, yeah. And um, obviously that is problematic because, um, in fact, uh, neither Jews nor Christians nor Muslims are just um, inheriting their religion because they belong to a certain family line or ethnic group, right? Even with Judaism, where sometimes that, um, that association is most uh, uh, often made, in fact, many people through the centuries have converted into Judaism. So, so it's complicated. But in, in the Quran, Abraham is clearly put forward as a model for the Quran's own prophet from Muhammad. I think that's clear. Um, the Quran um, associates him with the city of Mecca in particular, already in Surah Al-Baqarah, the second chapter of the Quran. I say already, not thinking chronologically, but yeah. <laughs> the order of the text. So if you open your Quran already in Surah 2, you're going to find a passage where it speaks of the building of the house by Abraham and Ismail, and then it will have Abraham pray for a new prophet to, be, to, be, to rise up among the people of that place. And so um, the, then there's this great story in the Sirah, uh, in the story of um, Muhammad's life, which has him, in, during his Mi'raj, or his ascension into heaven, has him meet Abraham, and he goes back and tells his companions, never have I seen a man who looks so much like myself. Aww. Right. So this is very important in the Quran, the Abraham connection, the connection between Abraham and the Quran's own prophet. There are also passages like in Surah 3, it's in the 60s somewhere, um, where the, the Quran has this declaration which says, um, O people of the book, why do you debate about Abraham, neither the Torah nor the Gospel, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, were brought down, I, I've put this wrong, <laughs> both the Torah and the Gospel were sent down after him, he was neither a Jew nor a Christian, but a Muslim and a Hanif, there's that key word Hanif, which means something like a natural monotheist. I see. So, um, uh, I, I'm not opposing the term Abrahamic religions. I think it's nice to have a label that brings Jews and Christians and Muslims together, but I would think to summarize the place of Abraham in the Quran, he's um, a prototype for Muhammad, and um, he's also a way for the Quran to advance its own claim to being the, um, uh, the guardian and the bearer of this, this monotheism that Abraham himself proclaimed. And so the Quran, therefore, uh, makes this strong claim that um, it is the most articulate and faithful spokesperson for, for the, uh, the religion of Abraham. Okay, wow, wonderful. Uh, thank you for that, Professor. Um, it's, yeah, there's a, a lot of discussion of Abraham in, of course, uh, you know, both the uh, biblical religion, Judaism and Christianity, as well right. as Islam, and um, it even comes up in Paul's writing or in, um, you know, Right, Christ's in Galatians. Speech. Yeah, yes. or, you know, the famous before Abraham was I am in, the, uh, oh, right. in John's Gospel. Um, but also, what about, what about Jesus? Let's move uh, a little bit further down. Because in the Bible, well, maybe you should just uh, maybe tell us, what, how does the Quran and um, as the New Testament, I guess, um, what are the similarities um, and, and differences when discussing Jesus of Nazareth? What a great question. Yeah, how, how to be articulate about this is not easy. <laughs> well, um, the big challenge in being coherent in regard to the Quran's Christology or presentation of Christ is um, the sorts of material about Jesus found in the Quran. And there's not much, actually. People have write, written, many, many books have been written about Jesus in the Quran, but there's, there's not much there in the Quran. So, for example, you know, as a rule, we, we don't have his public ministry, right? So the heart of the gospel accounts of Jesus, yes, you have nativity accounts in Luke and Matthew, of course, 
but the heart of the gospel presentation of Jesus are the three years of his public ministry, and then there's obviously a special foc focus on his passion, um, his suffering, death, and resurrection at the end of that. But in, in the Quran, you get almost nothing of that public ministry. And so um, you have reports of his uh, miracles, so both in Quran chapter 3 and in Quran chapter 5, around verse 110, you have, you know, um, the, the declaration that he uh, healed the lepers and the blind, he raised the dead. Oftentimes there's this ac extra statement that he did so with the permission of God. Um, there's this mention that he was able to know what people were storing in their houses, what they were eating, so some sort of clairvoyant miracles. But you don't get the, um, the long discourses, for example, that you find in the Gospel of John or the, the parables that you find in John, but especially in the Synoptic Gospels. Um, you don't get things like the Beatitudes um, and the Sermon on the Mount. Um, uh, and so um, some of the stories that would be familiar to some, some viewers, for example, of the prodigal son or the Good Samaritan, I mean, there's none of this. Uh, uh, and then you have interesting sort of allusions to biblical language in the Quran when it speaks about a mustard seed or um, a camel passing through the eye of a needle. But when the Quran uses that, or uses those phrases, it uses it in a different way. And so um, there's a lot more to be said. Yeah. <laughs> I've already said too much, probably, and I don't want to go on forever and ever. Obviously, there's a, a profound difference. I've just said that the Gospels focus especially on the, the passion of Christ, his suffering, death, and resurrection. And in the Quran, all we have in that regard is the famous verse 157 of Surah 4. Um, which may or may not deny the crucifixion. I think that's a hotly debated topic among scholars. Um, so, in brief, we could say that the Quran is interested in Jesus in as much as it allows the Quran to articulate its own theology. And Jesus is a, at least Christian belief in Jesus, is a problem for that theology um, because it has a very distinctive view of Allah of God and his distinctive view of, of prophets and that doesn't match with the Christian view and so Jesus becomes then a spokesman in the Quran and when he does speak which is not very often they're just a few statements they tend to be um, statements which are directed against Christian doctrine so it's reprimands to Christians so it's it's very different I, I, I think that the common the view of the Quran and the Bible on God and that, you know, I've written a book on this called Allah, God, and the Quran, is pretty darn close. I think the view of the Quran and the Bible on Jesus is not very close. I think it's profoundly different. And so, um, I don't know, this may not be such a revolutionary statement. Probably a lot of people agree anyway, but anyway, that's my statement. Well, that, yeah, thank you. Well said, Professor. Um, and I guess before we move on, uh, a, a final sort of question uh, about the kind of express relationship between the Quran and the Bible. Um, the, the question of the biblical text, how does the Quran think of the extant Bible, the biblical text as you know, we might find today um, or existed at the time? Right, so that brings up the, the question of biblical text brings up the, the question of scriptural falsification. Yeah. Um, which is really important for articulating um, an Islamic perspective on the Bible. Um, this is another difficult topic. It's difficult because there's centuries of polemics between Jews, Christians, and Muslims on the topic of Scripture. And so it's really hard to sort of put all of that aside and get back to the actual text and what the text is really saying. Because we tend to read these things through the lens or the prism um, of interpreters, right? And so we hear that um, the Quran considers the Bible to be corrupt. There's this Arabic word, tahrif, which is used to explain this. And um, so that, that can lead to views which are sometimes um, almost crass, that there was some sort of conspiracy and um, an original gospel was given to um, Jesus by God 
and he somehow proclaimed that, maybe even had it written down, in that it was destroyed, and others, the, the Christian Gospels were written in their place. When, when we look at the Qur'an, it's, it's much more complicated than that. Now, the Arabic word tahrif doesn't appear as a noun in the Qur'an, but we do have the verb yuharifuna, and um, it tends to appear with this phrase, yuharifuna kalima an muwadi'ihi, which means something like, they change or alter the words from or in respect to their meanings. And so it's really not clear if it's an accusation of scriptural falsification or misinterpretation or misappropriation. There are other references in the Quran to, um, uh, and by the way, these accusations usually are made against the Israelites and not against the Christians. Um, there are accusations to um, writing the book. I think it's maybe verse 79 of chapter 2, which says, Something like that. So, cursed be those, or woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say this is from God. So, um, uh, there is this accusation that some something has been written down, which people say is from God, but it's not really from God. On the other hand, this is the final bit, and I'll, I'll shut up. <laughs> But there are affirmations of the Bible in the Quran as well. So I believe it's Quran chapter 10, Surah Yunus, verse 94, which has God say to the Prophet, um, if you are in doubt regarding which we reveal to you, then ask those who are reading the book before you. And then in Quran chapter 5, it specifically commands the people of the Gospel to reveal according to what God is, has placed their sorry, to judge according to what God has revealed therein. And so um, we seem to have you know, a concern with um, misrepresentation of Scripture, but also an affirmation of the Scripture of Jews and Christians in other places, which, which makes it very complicated and difficult. Yeah, well, thank you for that, though. That uh, at least brings to light maybe some of the um, ongoing kind of difficulties of under that, you know, go into understanding this and actually bringing out you know, the picture as complex as it may be rather than just um, you know, different polemics that go, go about. So I guess we'll, we'll move forward and I almost, I want to maybe even kind of shift to a question that maybe uh, doesn't come up as much, but uh, I think it's a very interesting one. What do you think, if anything, uh, the Bible has to say about the Quran or kind of added revelation or something of this sort. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But added revelation meaning or something that comes after. Yeah. After or, or let's just keep it to what do you think the Bible maybe yeah. has to say about the Quran or something like it? Well, I mean, I guess one, I don't know if it's a cop out, but <laughs> one way to take the question is um, how can the study of the Bible better help us understand the Quran? I don't think that's exactly what you're asking, though. Uh, well, sh sure. Maybe uh, take it as you uh, take it as you think. I, what I was thinking more is um, if you if we can imagine ourselves in the um, in the kind of world of the seventh century, the, the or late sixth century. Um, how would the news of you know a revelation, a, a, a new revelation, strike? you know, a, a believer of the Bible at the time right. or, right. you know, something of right. that sort, maybe. Right, great, great. Okay. So, um, it's pretty clear from late antiquity, and this is not an area of expertise, but I feel, feel confident in saying this. It's pretty clear from late antiquity that Jews and Christians agreed that public revelation, that is new prophecy, um, in the sense of a new message given by God um, uh, was, was not going to come around. Now, it's a little bit complicated because in the Christian perspective, and I think this is clear in the Bible because um, uh, Paul speaks about gifts of prophecy, and there are prophets alluded to, um, for example, in uh, the Acts of the Apostles. I think there's a prophet named Agabus in there. Um, and then he speaks in his letters, uh, Paul does, about the gift prophecy being one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
So it's true that um, there is this sense that within, from the Bible, within the Christian community, God continues to guide. But there isn't this sense of um, uh, a prophet who would come to add to the deposit of faith. In fact, um, th there are some biblical verses which are pretty clear that, um, you know, um, all of the things written in Scripture are fulfilled in Christ. For example, I believe it's the end of Luke's Gospel, um, first when he's speaking to people on the road to Emmaus, and then when he's speaking, this is a risen Christ, when he's speaking to the other apostles where he says everything has been fulfilled. So there's a sense of completion, right? Um, so, uh, and that's what makes the Quran so unique in late antiquity. So most of the figures, even though there are lots of different sects and groups and from some, from people, some people's perspective, heresies that are out there in late antiquity, um, it generally there are not people claiming prophecy. And there may be Manny is an exception. I don't know if you want to sp speak about that or if you have a thought maybe, about it. Maybe briefly if you could tell us who, who that is. And Well, I don't know too much about this, but uh, you know, um, there's a figure named Manny who comes generally out of the world of Jewish Christianity. Um, so these are movements like the Ebionites and the Elkazites, and um, uh, s seems to have presented himself as a new prophet who's going to add something to the deposit of faith. And, um, you know, it, there's a report in Islamic literature, I think it's by al Biruni, that he called himself the seal of the prophets before, before um, Muhammad um, or the Quran would have Muhammad do so. So, um, but generally in late antiquity, people are not going around saying, I'm a prophet, um, unless in the limited Christian sense of, I'm proclaiming the gospel in a truthful way, um, which makes the Quran remarkable, right? It, it sort of stands out um, uh, from this perspective. Uh, so, um, but I would think there's one other way to answer the question, just very briefly, which is to of say course. that um, um, the Bible um, allows us to think of um, the, to recognize the, the uniqueness of the genre of the Quran. So um, the nature of the Bible, and I won't go on at length about this, but just as literature, is very different from the nature of the Quran. I mean, the Quran being um, maybe um, proclaimed, as most people would say, in a certain rhymed prose known as Sajjah, um, and proclaimed mainly in the voice of God, not exclusively, but basically in the voice of God, and so, um, I mean, one way that the Bible helps us see something more about the Qur'an is just saying, seeing the contrast between them. There's something very unique in terms of literary genre about the Qur'an. I see. And we can talk about kind of um, the literary genre and kind of structure of the different, uh, of the Qur'an and, you know, of different biblical texts as we go on, too. Um, I think your, your answer was, was kind of, as much as one can really give on such a question, and th thank you for that. Um, I guess my, my next question, uh, or the next question would be, um, and building off of what you said, what does prophecy, how, how, how similar are biblical and Quranic notions of prophecy, or of prophets, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you mentioned, you know, very similar ideas of God, um, different ideas of Jesus or, you know, the Christ, maybe, or the Messiah. Um, how, what about what about prophets? Sometimes with my students here at Notre Dame, I um, introduce the contrasting views on prophecy by saying it's a little bit like the word dessert. Uh, so um, the, uh, the meaning of dessert to one person could be like a hot fudge sundae, um, whereas to someone else could be a bowl of fruit. Right, so it could be totally different. The person who likes a hot fudge sundae for dessert would look at the bowl of fruit and might be like, that's not really dessert. That doesn't fit my definition. So there are, there are, um, there are pretty profound uh, differences between um, the Quran and the Bible in terms of prophecy, but those differences are brought together or the difference is lessened when we appreciate the development after the Bible in late antiquity of especially Christian thinking about the prophets. So the, there may be two big points to be mm -hmm. um, put forward. One is simply that the Qur'an, although I don't believe it has a view of the prophets as 
completely sinless. Um, and that's something to be spoken about, but I think, you know, it acknowledges in different ways that a prophet can sin and repent. Um, with the story of, of Moses, for example, and the Egyptian, uh, maybe of Joseph. Um, so, uh, um, uh, so, but generally, the view of the prophet is as a moral exemplar. Um, and that's because the prophets demand not only belief in God, but also obedience to the prophet in the Quran. Whereas, I, I think in the biblical narrative, I mean, if we look at the Bible, not as a, a library and a collection of different books, but as, as one book and try to see some coherence in it, um, the prophets are, above all, um, uh, people who speak the truth about God and whom God uses, not simply despite of, but because of their imperfections. So in a very different way, they're able to get to be exemplars, not really ethical or moral exemplars, but exemplars which point to the possibility that God can use anyone, right? So, th so that's one way in which there's a difference. But the other way in which there's a difference is the notion of the prophets delivering the same message. So not so much a buildup of salvation history where you have different covenants and um, a, a developing relationship between God and humanity, which is more a biblical view. But in the Quran, you have this view of the prophets basically come with the same message. And we see this really prominently in surahs like surah 7, 11, 26, 37, and 54, which have these cycles of prophet stories where the same thing happens time and again. So that, that's a pretty profound difference. Now, as I mentioned, the difference seems less extreme when you read the texts of Christianity in late antiquity. If you look at texts like the Syriac Cave of Treasures, Already, I think, in Jubilees, which is probably um, a Jewish text, um, at least initially it's received in Ethiopic uh, later on by Christians, um, but you see more of a cyclical vision there, where all of the prophets had a sort of full and robust knowledge of, of God and God's nature, and they were proclaiming it the same thing time and again, which is closer. Professor, I, just for the audience who might not know some of these things, um, what can you tell us what is the, you know, the cave, of, the Syriac cave? Uh, book of the cave, treasure, cave of Treasures right. and the Book of Jubilees, maybe just briefly, so we know what, what you're referring okay, to. Okay, so I'll do my best. Jubilees is an earlier text, and um, so uh, Jewish in origin, um, people should read what James Vanderkam um, has written about Jubilees. I think he's the real expert, though there's been more research done recently. Um, because I believe it's, it's not only known in Ethiopic anymore, but also in other languages. But it's basically a telling of the book of Genesis, and in a way which has characters before the revelation of the law show a certain prescience or um, pre-knowledge of, um, of the law. And then Cave of Treasures is a text which tells the story basically from Adam um, up to the time of Christ, from a Christian perspective, and with lots of Christological, typological language where people are doing things very symbolically anticipating the acts of Christ. Um, and uh, in the Cave of Treasures, as mentioned, was written in Syriac, which is a language closely related to Hebrew and to Aramaic, and was really widespread at the time of the Quran's origins, was a very, very popular yeah. text. So, uh, w w just one more question about mm -hmm. these texts. So the, what date are we thinking for the composition of these tanks? Well, Jubilees is much earlier, and I'll probably get it wrong if I guess at a date. Oh, okay. But I, I believe it's a, around the beginning of the Christian era. Okay. Um, but I, I don't want to say sure. something totally misleading. Whereas a Cave of Treasures is several centuries later. So it's translated, um, uh, or it's um, uh, if it doesn't have a Greek um, prehistory, um, the Syriac text is around, I know, by the 6th century. Um, but I think it, I, I, I believe there was a, a time where it was associated with Ephraim, who dies in 373, I think, um, AD 373. But that's, that's not right. It's, it's, not, it's not Ephraim's text. And it's probably a little bit later, but definitely pre quran Okay, I see. And then also for those who may not know, um, are these biblical texts or? Oh, that's a good good point, right? So these are not found in the canonical Bible. And, you know, part of the whole story of understanding the, the relationship between the Quran and the Bible is appreciating that basically with the closure of the biblical text, with the writing 
of, say, the Gospel of John, Book of Revelation, um, very early on in the Christian period, so probably first century, um, you, you have then Jews and Christians still writing and writing more and more, sort of this gigantic library of works in Greek and Latin, but also in the Eastern languages like Ethiopic and Syriac. Um, and these are the texts people are reading when Islam comes around, you know, uh, several centuries later, the first, you know, sometime in the early 7th century. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, and also, uh, I guess, uh, I guess another question that we've touched on before, but what is the... What is the Quran's idea of um, messiahship, maybe we'll say, or of the messiah? Cause, and correct me if I'm wrong, the Quran does refer to Jesus as the messiah. Right. Right, but how is that, how, how does the idea of the messiah differ, maybe? Or, or, or how does it compare? I don't think there's an idea. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think the Quran is interested in the concept of, of messiah. Um, I think the concept of Messiah is so intimately intertwined with um, the biblical story. And maybe it's good to give a little background uh, on that. Um, and I'm, I'm not an expert on this, so I'll just like, dance around and someone will come on the channel soon and, um, uh, and say something more profound. But um, basically, the, um, and please feel free to add, of course, and correct me. Um, basically, uh, the figure of David becomes central in Jewish thinking about God's plan for Israel and for the world. And there are certain passages um, in the historical books of the Old Testament in regard to David, where, um, but also in the, in the prophets, the later prophets such as Isaiah, which speak to um, an, a figure who will come from the line of David. And eventually the term associated with this figure is Messiah. Does that sound basically right? Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're much better with that. <laughs> and so the word Messiah um, from Hebrew means the one who's anointed. And um, obviously, you know, Christianity is only understandable with around this notion that, um, in fact, you know, God sent a Messiah who was Jesus of Nazareth and the rest of history. Um, so in, in the Quran, it's true, Jesus is frequently called with this Arabic term, al Messiah which is clearly cognate with Hebrew Mashiach, which is related to the Greek word, or the translation in Greek is where we get Christ, was Christos, and then English we get Christ. So, um, yes, the Quran calls Jesus Christ, but it, it's, not, it's not referring to these hopes in Isaiah or the historical books to the, the king, redeemer, savior, suffering servant, all these associations that become linked to the term Messiah. Um, I, I don't find any whisper of this in the Quran. Maybe someone can correct me, and I'll be happy to see if there's a real notion of Jesus as a messianic figure in the Quran. Um, uh, I think most likely that in late antiquity it was simply the words Jesus and Messiah were used interchangeably. And so the Quran um, speaks of Jesus and Messiah. Now, some people would say the Quran does this intentionally as a way of making a statement in the context of Jews in Medina. And so um, Jews who rejected the idea that Jesus is Messiah or Christ, and it's intentionally affirming that Christian claim as a sort of response to the Jews. I don't see that in the Quran either. So I would be careful about that. I think that's probably not right. Anyway, okay. that's my answer. Well, th thank you for that. That's um, actually quite enlightening. Um, and I'd like to maybe let's shift uh, gears a little bit here. We've been talking a lot about the Bible and the Quran, different characters and themes and whatnot. Um, let's go back to the world of um, kind of late antiquity to the seventh century, as you described, and um, we're kind of building up to this idea of um, you know the advent of Islam, um, you know, uh, the Quran. What can the Bible um, or kind of this biblical subtext tell us about Quranic origins? Ultimately, do you think? Well, it can tell us a lot. I think that's a real key to understanding the Quran, um, w w and we'll have other. Um, episodes on this or interviews on this channel that will get into the 
evidence for the origins of Islam in light of um, inscriptions that have been found in Arabia recently um, uh, and what they what those inscriptions tell us about the religious context and milieu at the dawn of Islam so um, but I, I think the more we learn about um, Arabia in the sixth and seventh centuries uh, the more we appreciate how widespread monotheism was especially Christianity in a sense we should have known that already now the problem of course is that the biography of the prophet speaks a lot about pagans and so you get things like this movie that was done called um, The Message have you ever seen that movie? Mustafa, I don't think Mustafa I have. did it, the Jordanian producer I mean it's an old one, it's from the 1970s so <laughs> I think it's the 70s in which you know the whole backdrop are like the pagans of Arabia, there are pagans everywhere the Kaaba was a, was, a, was a house for idols. All the tribes around were pagan. And basically, Muhammad's challenge was to call the pagans to monotheism. You know, but the more we learn about from documentary or epigraphic, meaning inscriptions, sources, the more we see that, no, there were lots of monotheists around. Now, the Quran speaks of mushrikun, which is a term that means associators and is often associated with pagans. Um, it doesn't speak a lot of about idolatry. Mostly when it does, it's in the context of the Abraham cycle, Abraham story. So, um, uh, but the Quran speaks much more than that about biblical characters. We've spoken already a little bit about this, you know, but from Adam to Jesus, John the, John the Baptist, from Christian tradition, John the Baptist, and Mary, I mean, it's really interested in both the so-called Meccan period and so-called Medinan period, so both the period between 610 and 622 in the traditional chronology and that between 622 and 632. There's biblical uh, allusions and references. It sometimes it doesn't have to speak about Jesus like explicitly, but um, the way it, it's, uh, it speaks about the cosmos, about nature, about heaven and hell, about the apocalypse, um, even in its laws, food laws, um, Holger Zellington has worked a lot about this, it just seems to be soaked through with a biblical context. And I just add, I think it's important, um, Hassan, if I just add one note that, you know, recognizing this, it doesn't mean one thing or another for the legitimacy or the validity of the Quran, right? Um, the same thing goes for the Bible, right? You can recognize ancient Near East uh, traditions and find how the Bible is alluding to them, that doesn't mean it's not a vote for or against the Bible. So too with the Quran, seeing that it's connected with its historical context, doesn't mean anything for people who see it as divine revelation or people who don't. Um, uh, because, you know, the question of its revealed nature is of a fundamentally different um, kind. Um, so that will be probably a lot of uh, material for this part, and you know, we've been over a lot, so I think we should probably conclude there, and there will be, uh, we'll do an additional part to this. Professor, I'll let you maybe conclude and um, you know, speak to the audience and say what you want to say. Great, so. great. Thank you so much, Hassan. Um, yeah, this was sort of the beginning of a conversation, and uh, my one parting message for this uh, part one of the of the conversation at least is don't judge the whole channel based on my thoughts because there are going to be guests who will be much more intelligent and eloquent um, but hopefully you found something interesting and you'll watch our other videos thanks Hassan. all right thank you professor